Let's talk about some lures. You got a lot laid out here, and this is just a small selection of what you use. But when a guy walks in a store and looks at all this, how do you tell which is the right lure, which is the best working lure, and maybe the question is really what's the lure that works best for what you're trying to do with it? Well, that's a good question, and the whole thing you need to do right off the bat is first of all, how much experience do you have in throwing big baits? You need to walk into a store and say, I've never done this before, or I'm a good uh, mechanic of throwing big baits, I ocean fish. You have to find a, a baseline, and the baseline is, if you've never thrown a big bait and you go out there and start trying to heave something like this around, you're probably going to get tired, worn out, or something's going to break real quick on you. So you might have to start on a low baseline. You might have to start off small, something a little bit smaller you can use with equipment that you have at the time, and then gradually work up. Because remember, we're talking about it's not a quick fix. There's no magic lures. It's basically dedication, desire, and persistence in going out and trying to improve your fishing skills. So that's the first thing you need to do is go out there and try to get a, get a starting point and then once you find that starting point, you go from there. Well, how different, like for instance, a bait, let's say this is more of the traditional type of swim bait that people think about. You know, it's a, it's a hand pour plastic as opposed to a castaic type bait that's a little more complicated and then you get up to the lip bills. Bet say between these two, are there some significant differences that a guy needs to know? Well, first of all, you got to look at mechanics. Mechanics are the biggest key on doing swim baits. Now, if you go out to a lake and there's a bite where you have suspended fish that we might find today, um, you might want a bait that has a, a good drop rate where you can tie a line onto it. It's a semi-light lure. You throw it out there and on a semi-slack line, the lure itself will fall and the tail will kick. So you get action with, within the fall. Now, if you turn around and you start throwing other type of baits, like this cast ache, this is a, and you know, every bait's so different out there nowadays because it's not like the fishermen are making it, it's designers and artists are making these baits. This one has an internal system in it that it actually, instead of falling head down first, it actually slowly sinks. So each lure has its different components working through the water column. So that's the biggest factor is you might want a certain style of bait to achieve a certain type of depth or action and you'll pick up the wrong one in the store if you don't look at it and you go out there and it does it completely what you're not expecting it to do and then you're like either okay this lure doesn't work or the fish aren't eating it. So the big thing is is you're going out there there's a two-way two-step approach. You go out there and you go am I starting or have I have been doing it for a while. If I'm starting, what you want to do, first of all, get a lure that floats. Get a topwater bait, okay? So would you say start small? Definitely, you know, I would say definitely start small if you've never now done it. Now for most thing. people, this isn't small. I mean, right now as we stand bass fishing, most people would look at this lure and be amazed that you that a fish would eat it. But, but it isn't small. Okay, well, something like this. This is what, 12 inches? Yes. Okay, why isn't this small? Well, the whole thing is, is people don't understand. Most people are just standard bass fishermen. You guys have gone out there and thrown a seven inch worm. People have gone out and thrown a nine inch worm. You've thrown a bomber long A. It's not actually the size. You have to put yourself in the fish's position. Well, wait, wait a second, Bill. Look at, look at the shot in the camera. That's huge. That is huge if you think one dimensional. We're not looking at baits one dimensionally anymore you have to put yourself in the fish's position. If this bait now approaches the bass head on, now the only thing you actually see is this little teeny square of a lure. That's what the fish sees. So no matter if this bait is nine inches long or you go down to a bait that's six inches long, you're still seeing part of the bait. The other thing is what we're talking about, you have a 12 inch lure a bass's position where it's going to come up underneath the bait. You take that 12 inch lure and now you turn it sideways and what you do is you see a sliver of a bait. So angles are a key that you have to use in your advantage. Now you've talked about, um, or we've talked about fishing, about a bait like this near the surface and a fish is down 20 feet. This really is more of a drawing card to them to get them to come up where a, a bait maybe this size wouldn't attract their attention if exactly. they're 20 feet down. 
Right, and this is the thing you got to start thinking about. And I could probably almost prove the point right here against the yeah. side of the boat. For every lure, there's a certain mass to it. You're going to have shadowing effects. Clearer the water, um, depending on wind, cover, you name it, things are going to be down there that you got to start thinking about. Now, if we look at the side of a boat as being the bottom of a contour of, of the lake, and you have fish in a cover, you know, say uh, overhanging rocks or a big bush and stuff, 20, 30 feet down, most people will think, okay, if I throw a, a top water or something like that, and it's you know a little spook or something, they could draw fish up. Well, that's the case if fish are out looking up. Most of the time, if they have overhanging cover, they're looking out into that water. Mm -hmm. They're looking down towards the bottom. Problem is, you get a little bait up there, and maybe with 20, 30 feet, you're not throwing a big shadow. The shadow's the key. Now the bigger you get a bait, increase it. Watch it on the side of this boat right here. See it down here on this, let's see, right here on the side of this boat. You see the bait working down against this? Okay, that bait is throwing the perfect shadow. It has the action, it has the shape and size, and now at 20 to 30 feet down, a fish could be looking out from some type of cover and actually spot this lure pulls the fish out of his home. Where he I, I've seen it happen on other lures, like a jig or oh, everything. split shot. But a guy will say, well, I don't live in clear water conditions, but aren't you fishing most of your top water type baits or these kind in a little clear water? No. You know, the, the funny thing is, is there's other factors besides having a big lure, big mass in it, that in clear water you have good visibility in darker water, you're also throwing out a lot of vibration. And we know bass use other sensories to, to fit, uh, feed off. Well, one thing, I'm fighting the sun right here. It's right. so bright. So a lot of guys will want to go down a shoreline, turn around and take it easy on their eyes. But that's really the wrong thing to do. Well, it is in some parts, and this is how you look at it. You might go into a cove or something, and the sun is coming from your, your backside, OK? So now if you throw any type of lure, and it, this goes to any type of fishing, and that's where we're not going out of the realm of just bass fishing, you know, we're, we're thinking catching fish and different tactics. If we throw a lure in front of us, say into a cove or off a point that has good cover or structure down there that fish could possibly hide under, and you start bringing that lure towards you, and the sun's from your back, what happens is, depending on the depth, the sun will hit this bait. We already know that it throws a great shadow. Mm -hmm. The shadow is actually behind the bait depending on water depth. You have to triangulate that type of degree. Well, if this bait comes out and now the shadow passes 20 feet down, but it's 40 feet away from this lure because of the angles, the fish, you'll pull the fish out. It'll actually come after the shadow, turn around and look, and there's nothing there because your bait's out of his strike zone. So what you do is you do multiple casts. It might take two or three times for you to finally get that fish out and go, okay, now I see it. Now we reverse, reverse the sun, and it might be the one cast approach. Because now you throw it out there, and the shadow's in front of the lure, the fish comes out, looks up, and the lure comes in the strike zone. I'm just thinking, a lot of times you'll go out one day, the fish just won't quite get the bait. And the next day, <clears throat> they'll get the bait. Is that part of the deal? Is it maybe why you're giving these multiple casts is that you have to keep throwing back because they're not seeing that bait soon enough. They're get coming out from their cover and, and not quite getting to it. That, that could be the big factor. And like I said, we always preach the one cast approach, but there are other factors out there that you have to always constantly think of. It's weather, moon phase, sun, wind, you know, water clarity. There's other factors that you have to play in and that's why you have to keep thinking. Okay, we've talked about these other things. Let's go on to something like this. This looks totally low tech. I mean, it is. This is something my grandfather would have used. And if you look at an antique lure catalog, there's things that look extremely similar to this. But this was the standard bearer of the big bait craze back in the late 80s, early 90s. It's a topwater lure made out of maybe a that table was the, leg. That was a table leg. A little plastic thing inserted with, looks like you had toothpicks there. So how does something like this, this low tech, make such a difference when we've got so many other baits that are injection molded with internal rattles and every other? Well, see, this, this is the starting point. And, and as you look at big baits and the revolution of them and, and how they um, grew in the industry, this was the first step. People went out there and made something very simplistic, which sometimes that's the easiest thing to do, is basically a topwater bait 
and it was simple for a lot of fishermen to use it. This was the biggest step for most anglers to get into the big bass fishing. What happens is the pressure and stuff, they, you know, they might have tapered off, but what you're asking is, why was this so simple and now they're doing injection molds and stuff? Well, it's the times. You know, people know things work now. But those have never caught on in the rest of the country except for striper fishermen and musky fishermen. Right, you know, and that's the funny thing is, this technique caught on in the rest of the world. You know, because if you go talk to guys back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and they say, oh, you know, we went out there with big red fins and we slow rolled different type of lures across the water and we always used to catch pretty good sized bass. There's techniques out there that have always worked and people who figured it out have been using it, but it's the lures. The lures have been Now you talked better. about slow rolling. That's just speed, right? We're just it, talking the slow reeling right. of them. Most people like you're explaining is, you know, you go out there, most people fought in the heyday is slow rolling, you threw a spinner bait out to the bottom and you slow roll it over the contour of the bottom. The, the whole objective of slow rolling is learning your equipment, gear ratio, line size, taking a little time learning that and then going out there and what you're doing is you're doing a constant steady retrieve with your reel. Okay, something about these that, these are work ultra slow. I mean, you cannot reel slow enough almost. Exactly. Is that a key to all big bass fishing? Well, you know, no, not necessarily. That people don't really get that slow or they don't change their speed? Well, what happens is most people get in a routine of just casting and winding. And what happens is if you look at the spectrum of dead sticking, no movement at all, to speed trolling or something extremely faster than you think, you get the majority of the population are in the center part where they just cast and wind. They never try to get to the other bounds, you know, from one end to the other extreme. These lures were specifically made when we made them when I was younger to go slower than most people would ever think about using them. You've got something else you've told me that um, that I, I'm not sure what most people understand is that's the what we call the illusion right. speed of, a, of any bait. Any bait has an illusion speed, so explain a little bit about that. Well, you know, there's an illusion speed and there's also a workable speed for every lure out there. Now, illusion speed, if you went to something like a tube, okay? And that's a big tube. And that's actually the smaller of the big <laughs> tube. If you went to a tube, what you're trying to do is, this doesn't have a lot of detail. You know, you're not looking at a bait that has extreme detail. You're looking at something that, okay, what does this represent? You first of all try to figure out what it represents. I'm looking at this as a representative ball of shad. If I work this too slow in certain situations where bass are trying to key in on shad, then my illusion speed has to increase so the bass thinks it's seeing what it wants to see. Now when you get into something like this where you turn around and you go, okay, unbelievable detail, the speed and stuff. Now, first of all, you got to find workable speed. Every lure has a workable speed. The better lures sometimes are Meaning the that's the speed that it performs best at. Right, that, that you might have the kick, the perfect tail kick, the, the perfect fall, the, the, um, the pendulum action. But there might be other lures out there that might have a higher end. You know, you might have the super, super slow speed it works at and the super fast speed, and you still have all the action built in the lure. And that's why it's so difficult that people need to understand is each lure has, first of all, a certain speed the lure can produce through certain ranges. And then also you have an illusion factor. Does the lure have the perfect color, shape, um, image? of what you're trying to represent at that given time that the bass turns around and looks at it and goes, that's what I expect to see in this certain spot and it's doing exactly what I want to do. Boom, I'm going to go up there and approach the sewer. But that eat. illusion thing can change. This, the illusion here is because of the, the detail of the lure. Right. Here, it's on a, it's going slow, but it's on the surface and it's showing more of a silhouette and it, the illusion is the disturbance along the surface. Right, which the neat thing about top water is and that's where, you know, going back just a little bit in what fish perceive in angles, if you threw something like this subsurface, or just go like, you threw something like this subsurface, and fish had a better opportunity to see different angles approaching it, and you threw this on the surface, the funny thing is, it's this on the surface with a straight white line with the tail kicking, and this on the surface with a straight white line kicking, they're seeing only a percentage of the bait, and that's the whole key. That's what you got to start thinking about is how that fish is going to look at that bait at that certain retrieve. Let's go into the tube just a little more. Why don't you pull out the rigging so that people can see just what we're talking about. 
this is a six inch tube. Here's an eight inch tube. Right. And you're trying to duplicate like a small pot of shad that's got out somewhere in the water column where it really shouldn't. That and also you're, you're trying to put stuff in a in a place where it should be, but bass are expecting it to should, you know, it should be too. Now the whole thing on a tube is when I started fishing these years ago, is I paid a lot of attention to bait fish. I went out there, I grafted balls of bait, I watched balls of bait up in the water column, and what happens is you have a ball of bait with bigger fish around the, the perimeter of these fish, uh, these bait fish, and you'll have a bass run through it, and what I call is a stringer, you'll get one or two shad that'll dart off from this ball, and adjacent to that, or behind it, you'll have 50 or 20 other little baits swimming behind it, and it makes this little stringer you know, bait fish. It runs out the side and the bigger bass usually eat those unless they come back into the ball. So the whole thing was this is right off the bat is I knew I was trying to create the illusion of a ball of bait with these tubes. So we got these tubes, you know, I, I had tubes made by a guy, Deadly Duel, back uh, in um, Bakersfield. And what I did is we kept refining it to get the right action, shape, taper, tentacles to uh, make the illusion better. You know, what action are you trying to get? Well, first of all, it, it all comes back to your cover and structure. Now, open water, you might be able to do you know, more erratic puffing action, um, but if you go over to a point, a uh, place that has a bunch of brush or grass lines, maybe you want to work this ball of bait along the grass edge like a ball of shad's you know, doing it. Now, when bigger fish hit this, it's, it's got a lot of plastic, but does the fact that it compresses in their mouth make a difference? as far as how long they'll hold on because that's the that's the enduring right concept of those baits right and the, the neat thing about this usually if you throw a smaller tube and we've seen tubes you know out there about two inches yeah. a fish expects when it eats something like that that it feels natural to them well what we have done is we've created the illusion of a ball of bait and what happens is since, since it's hollow a big fish will actually come up crush this bait and when it crushes it besides filling all the hooks in it it doesn't fill any mass. It, it fills nothing, and, and it's like, uh-oh, I got caught doing something I wasn't supposed to. So these baits, even though you can create many strikes, many follows, you know, a lot of fish in your boat, you have to be aware enough that once you get that fish to attack this bait, you create an illusion that he's going to well, spit man, it really quick. And that's probably the reason for the this helping have the stinger hook and as well as a mainline hook, a jig hook? Right, you gotta remember any lure out there is only as good as the rigging you put into it, the time you spend on thinking how fish attack a lure. Before you get started, this is real similar to a normal standard size tube bait as far as the, uh, the rigging, as far as getting it straight or is it different? It's different, first of all, it's bigger. It's 10 times bigger than the standard tube bait. Notice that. <laughs> the other thing is, is what you're doing is when you increase, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is when you increase the size of a lure, there's a lot more lure out there that doesn't have hooks in it. So every time a fish hits at or strikes at it, you want to put the odds in your favor. What I've done is we came up with a jig head that actually when you put it inside a tube, it comes up and it fits the contour of the bullet shape of the, of the head. And what that does is it also places, if you can see this, it places that there which also forces that jig hook up out of the body better. So you don't have more of a weedless approach in this system. You, you know, you have a spot that if a fish comes up and strike, it's going to get a lot of hook. Also what I've done is I put a wire trailer stinger on it for 100% safety factor. Guys can use this musky fishing, ocean fishing, and if you catch the fish, the only way this thing's going to come apart is this hook straightens perfectly out. The other factor is we put a big mustad hook on it, and the third part is people looking at is the keeper. The key to the keeper is, is it's a couple factors that you got to think of. When you put a stinger hook on and you have a chance of possibly catching two fish over 10 pounds in one cast, you want to have a 100% safety factor. So this keeps the stinger from popping up. I don't up. think most people are worried. I think they're worried about one. Well, you never know. You might get lucky on that first day. The other thing is, is you increase the surface area with this disc when it's inside the body of a tube. And what that does is, first of all, also keeps that hook up in place within the tube, and it keeps that this part of the hook ripping through the tube faster. So when it's perfectly centered in this tube, and you rig it, what you do is you, put, you open up the back part of the tube, you place the hook in it, you slide the big part of the barb down in there, 
and you set the tube up just like you would a plastic worm. You want it to run true. You put it out and you pop the head of the eye through. Now the key on this for action is the closer you get this eye to the tip of the lure, it's going to have a more straight type of pull to it. If you bring the eye of the hook back just a little bit, now you have a planing surface. And that's the key is when you start getting that really erratic action of the tube. That triggers a lot of bites. So when you're when you're retrieving it, you're trying to get kind of a walk the dog kind of look. Yeah, and hopefully it. we get out on the water today, we'll get some pictures of that tube actually darting back and forth. And that's the whole key is you're creating the illusion of bait fish trying to get away. And when you look them in the water, a lot of them just, you know, a single fish usually on straight ahead. You get a ball of them and they go back and forth. How critical is that? I mean, are we talking an eighth of an inch? Is that pretty critical as far as if you move it back a little bit? Well, the neat thing about this thing, it's not stationary. You throw it out there and you don't get the action you want to dart a little bit more. You pop the eye out, you bring the eye back a little bit more and you're going to okay. get more of a surface. Okay, so you pop that eye through and when you pop the eye through, the other critical part is laying the tube in your hand, finding the point of the hook and just like a worm, everything's in line. You push the plastic forward, you pop the hook out. And now what you see is you see a tube sitting there with a big bite of that, that hook and the trailer hook is placed about mid-center of the tentacles. If that trailer hook is down too far, you're going to get a lot of foul hooking. If it's up too high, basically what you've done is you still missed half of that lure with no hook placement. And we'll talk about the casting later, but on something like this, let me get you a reel. You've talked about how people we were talking about retrieve and in that bait and all these baits you're talking about different cadences and speeds what's the critical thing to remember that uh, to get out of that rut of just grinding and and staying at that same speed all the time see that's the whole that's the whole key on this is first of all they always talk about finding a pattern you know the patterns within patterns and stuff well a lot of that actually comes down to the cadence of a, of a lure that may be the really biggest factor of triggering a fish to strike. And what I've done is when I first went out and bought my reels, no matter if it was a Calcutta 250 or a 400, put the line on that you're going to use, the size. Then what I usually do is I'll fill the spool up and I'll mark it with a pin. And then actually I'll take one revolution with that pin and bring that much line in. And I find out with a Calcutta 400 with 25 pound string, one revolution at full spool, I'll bring 21 inches in. So that's, that's a key right there. Now we go out and say we're um, long lining or we're throwing a tube or we have the wind to our back and we actually throw enough line out where we get down to a half a spool on this, which is possible. Your line intake went from 21 inches down to 15 and a half inches. So when I'm throwing out there or if I had a smaller reel like a 250, in one cast I can throw out and actually probably bring my bring my lure in at 11 inches per revolution all the way up to 21 inches per revolution. Now if the cadence, which is a musical tempo that we're always trying to explain that there's a tempo for the bass to strike at, you might have to throw out when the reel's at a certain level you have to know where it's at. You might have to reel faster in the beginning of the speed of your cast because you have to bring in more line. Halfway through you need to slow down and by the time you get closer to your full spool you might be going super slow because you're bringing in almost twice as much line for each revolution. So to maintain, actually to maintain a constant rate, which is what most of these people are thinking they're doing. They're increasing. They're constantly, if they maintain, if you maintain the same crank on this reel throughout your cast, your retrieve, you're progressively speeding that. That lure is coming faster and faster and the whole thing is we're trying to try to, we're trying to hit speed zones from extremely so, slow to dead sticking all the way up to speed trolling or speed ripping, which is something to think about. If I'm trying to bring this lure in fast, at a fast rate and keep it constant, I might have to go twice as fast in the beginning and then slow down and still bring it in fast at the end. So it's a conscious thing, but it's the key to catch bigger fish. We need to talk about rods, because when you got me going on the big bait stuff, uh, you try to use what you got for a while. Right. Um, flipping stick, heavy jig rod, uh, really rods that are at the upper end of, of power for what most people think we're doing. What's the difference with a good big, 
big bait stick as opposed to something you've already got out in the garage. Right, as you know, I've done this for a lot of years and I've tried every rod out on the market. Um, I was fortunate enough to hook up with Lama Glass and they said I could design a rod that's gonna be capable of doing my style of fishing. The neat thing, or the really important thing you need to know about big bait fishing is big bait fishing, depending on the situation and where you're fishing in the US or waterways and stuff, a big bait might be a smaller six inch swim bait. Um, you fish Cast Ake, Lake Casitas, a big bait might be a 12 inch trout. The difference is, is you have a bait that might weigh three and a half ounces going to a bait that might weigh 12 to 16 ounces. The whole thing I try to do is find a rod that's going to be capable of throwing multiple lures. So I have four or five of the same rods with the same reel with the same rod, uh, line. Because remember, everything is mechanically to your advantage if you know exactly how it feels, how it works in your hands. If I picked up five different rods with five different swim baits, each one of them is going to act differently. Which you might not feel that light touch or the fish coming behind the big bait and swimming up on you. So what are the basic particulars as far as you know, fast taper or right. heavy butt, midsection? That... What I did first of all is you know I also fish tournaments and I throw a lot of big baits in tournaments. So legally I had to do a rod that's a little bit under eight foot. We made this eight foot exactly for tournament situations that we can go out there and fish. The other thing is, is I have the leverage now with the length of the rod and when I looked into building a rod what I wanted to do is I wanted a semi parabolic rod. I didn't want a rod that had a quick, if you get back a little bit, I didn't want a rod that had a real quick tapered tip and then a solid butt section or you get the rods that have a real light tip and then it goes in. What I want to do is I wanted to have a parabolic rod that when I'm throwing a bait that's weighing a pound if the whole rod itself absorbs the lure and the line, you're not getting friction on any one guide. The other thing is, is if you turn around and you throw a bait that weighs a pound, you pick up another rod that weighs six ounces, it's still going to load the rod up, you're going to get good distance with it, and this is an extension of my body. The whole thing is we got a long butt handle, the way you cradle it in, and there's different techniques from ripping tubes to slow, slow rolling swim baits, is if I pick up a rod no matter what I'm using and it feels the same with every lure I have it's an extension of my body and those slightest little touches which could be the biggest fish in the water you know you're gonna be able and to And I get also it. know a guy my size this is still comfortable it just takes a little get getting used, used to. Right. I know a lot of guys will pick this up in a it's, I, I'm 5'8 and I know they'll pick this up in a store and go that that's a lot of rod Right. But we'll see more about that later when we get into the casting on how to do the lob cast because all that comes into play then. Right. How you position the boat, how you stand, and how do you put the rod into your body and use it to your advantage. Okay, I think that's it.